Welcome to Japan Seikatsu. I'm Ian, and today we have a fascinating interview with Lou, who got his MBA in Tokyo and now works for one of Japan's largest tech companies in the United States. Without further ado, let's get started. Lou, welcome to Japan Seikatsu. It's great to have you.、Uh, thanks for having me. And、uh, as you mentioned, my name's Lou.、Uh, I've been a professional for about 15 years now.、Uh, graduated with a degree in chemical engineering, worked a little bit on the oil and gas side in the US, did an assignment over in Singapore and a little bit in Japan. And then after that, I came back, worked a little bit more in the US. I did pursue my MBA in Japan, and now I'm working for a large Japanese company in the US. And I've been there for about four years now.、Um, speaking of the MBA, not many people、uh, from your neck of the woods decide to get their MBA on the other side of the world. So, can you give us some background be- behind that decision just to get an MBA, but also、um, to get an MBA in Japan? To answer that question, I need to share a little bit about just a little bit my own thought process, who I am. I am definitely a planner. Ever since I went through high school and college,、um, there wasn't really anybody out there to plan things for me. It was kind of up to me. And so I remember very early on, I always wanted to get an MBA. I had a technical engineering degree, but all those folks around me were like, hey, an MBA is a good idea. It kind of diversifies you. You've got a little bit of the technical edge and the business edge. And so it was always in my mind that I wanted to do an MBA. I didn't quite have the Japan. Element solidified yet, but I got kind of thrust into it when I started working with my first、uh, company. I was offered an assignment abroad in, of all places, Singapore, which I didn't have my passport at the time. So I had to actually get my passport and get that ready to go to Singapore. So when I got out to Singapore, I was exposed to Japanese clients. Singaporean clients, Thailand clients, et cetera. But it was really the Japanese clients that changed my outlook, so to speak. And I knew I always wanted to return to Japan. It had a very profound impact on my life and my career. And so after that, when my assignment ended, I was like, you know, I always wanted to do this MBA. And I kind of really liked my experience in Japan. Is there any way I can combine the two? And so I eventually I came back in 2010 off my assignment and I started researching US based schools with Japan study abroad type、um, options.、Right. And I found out very quickly, you know, it's expensive, it's, it's very, very limited in the opportunities to stay in Japan. You know, you, you did like a, a, a semester abroad or something. And so I started to hone in on Japanese schools in Japan that were well regarded. And I landed on schools like Waseda, Doshisha, Hitotsubashi, IUJ. And I really honed in on Hitotsubashi because I was very, very surprised at the, the affordable、uh, costs, but also the very high quality of the program, the, fa- the faculty, and the experience. And so, All of those elements combined made it a very easy decision to say, I want to do an MBA in Japan. This is right for me. Can you tell a little bit more about that research? Did you, you know, is this online research where you're reaching out to students? Were you, were you visiting these campuses? You know, really, everything's in your hands. So don't hesitate. I found people are very, very open and polite. They want to share information. At the beginning, I was like,、oh, I don't want to bother anybody. Everyone's busy. They're in this program. But I found people are very, very happy to answer questions. I reached out to folks. Through LinkedIn, I noticed that they were doing an MBA program in Doshisha outside of Kyoto. And they mentioned other schools that I had no idea existed in Japan. So I just reach out to folks through my network. I talk to people within my the, the company I was working with at the time, had a couple of Japanese、uh, employees. I spoke to them. So I did a lot of online research, a lot of kind of work through your connections type research. And then、um, I just kind of, whenever I had a business trip over to Japan, I tried to make the most of it. I know many folks don't have that opportunity, but 
it wasn't critical to, to visit, but it was a nice to have. I, I walked around IUJ, I walked around Waseda, I walked around a couple other campuses, but it was just nice to get out there, get a feel for the environment and what it would be like. So yeah, I would say um, don't hesitate to reach out. But folks, I think are in general really, really helpful. It's quite interesting. I, I don't want to go too far off, but um, the fact that you were having business trips, I know that you're in the energy sector, you mm. work at ExxonMobil. Um, That's right. And what, what was ExxonMobil doing that was bringing you to Japan for business trips? It was kind of being in the right place at the right time. I was off of this assignment in Singapore because I was working in a particular technology area that they needed someone out in Singapore, of all places, to support this technology. And this particular technology was used across a number of refineries that at that time ExxonMobil owned jointly with a Japanese company in Japan. And we had refineries outside of Tokyo, outside of Osaka, um, places like Wakayama. So because I supported this technology, it enabled me to take a trip out to Japan. And so when I was able to fly out of Singapore into Japan, it was a wonderful experience that really got me exposed to Japanese business, uh, obviously Japanese culture, and it really opened my eyes to this really amazing world. Uh, the challenges and the excitement and you know everything else that goes along with it, it just allowed me to get that much closer to uh, Japanese business and culture. You also mentioned that you've always been, planning has been important to you and that you really yeah. you, you know needed to plan stuff out for yourself. Do you think that played into some of the attraction and the excitement of Japanese culture when you when you went there on those business trips. It must have been quite impactful if you were then energized enough to want to pursue an MBA afterward there. I would describe it as if you're if you're working in an environment and you've had a couple of experiences. The best way I can describe it is you know when you are operating at your highest uh, abilities or potential. Right. And for some reason, I've always worked my best. I've always been very motivated. I've been very um, humbly rewarded when I've worked in Japan. And right. I found that when I got over there and I was on this assignment, I, I, I love the, the, the Japanese are very process oriented. Uh, I found that I'm very process oriented. Um, I enjoy some of the sometimes the, the longer elements that it takes to work through certain um, pieces of negotiations or discussions. And, you know, you can't just jump right in. You've got to do it the right way. So I really found that rewarding and it, it really I felt just in harmony and, and in rhythm with a lot of the, the the dealings that were going on with various activities and projects I was working with. And so when I left that environment, I didn't feel I was uh, operating at my highest ability. Right. It was, um, I found myself running into more, uh, not, not like roadblocks or, or I wasn't running into a wall per se, but it was more of just, uh, I had a couple of stumbles and I, I was like, oh gosh, yeah, yeah, I have to be, I have to be mindful of this particular aspect of uh, American business culture, even though I'm, I am American. So, right. you know, I just found it was it was harmonious and it just felt right. And so I, I enjoyed it. The challenges were not really frustrating to me, although they can be to many folks, but I found I really enjoyed it and it was just the, the right environment for me. And so when I found that, I didn't really want to be too far away from it for too long because it just, it, it made it that much easier to get through, uh, you know, an eight hour, 10 hour work day, whatever you're, you're, you're doing, if you're spending this much time working, I just found it much more palatable and, and uh, you know, manageable in, in my experience. If we can uh, go back to what you were talking about when you left Singapore, I believe you said it was 2010 and you yeah. started this process of searching for an MBA and, and fairly quickly narrowed in on Japan and, and Hitotsubashi's ICS program in particular. Now, uh, it's a major commitment of time, and I know it's a major, um, it's a major financial commitment. How, how did you go about uh, financing that MBA and, and deciding, you know, what type of program that you wanted to do? I know there's a two-year program. I know there's a one-year program. Anybody um, who's working while considering to do an MBA, 
unless you're very, very fortunate, which there are cases where your employer will, will continue paying your salary while you get an MBA. I, I was not one of those fortunate individuals, but you're always facing down this difficult question of, okay, what's my opportunity cost? Um, I'm going to be, you know, every month, every year I spend doing an MBA, it's, it's another moment of time where I'm not earning a salary. So that's a big, depending on where you are in your career, it's a very big decision. And so you, you've got this lost salary and, and I fully understand you're trying to better yourself, which is what I was trying to do. You're trying to diversify yourself, but you know, you're not earning as much money. And you're also in many cases paying for the tuition, your room and board. And so it was a big decision for me and me personally, at the time of my MBA, you know, I was four years, five years roughly um, into uh, my marriage. And it was not my, just my decision. I had to really carefully consider and discuss with my wife on what, what, what do we do? And so for me, the one year program was the the, the, at a minimum, that was the, the compromise to kind of shoot for. Okay, if I'm going to leave my job for a year, a um, year is better than two, right? It might be more intense, but um, that gives me a, a good trade-off. I don't have to suffer through two years of salary, lost salary. I can do one. Right. So I was like, okay, can I do some one-year programs? So I was looking and honing in on that. Then I'm like, okay, what are, what are the scholarship opportunities? This would be fantastic to obviously get any type of financial support. But since I'm a planner, you know, I was putting away, you know, some money each month. I think it was about 12 or 15 months in advance. I was just putting away a little bit of money each month in just in case, you know, so I, I don't get fully reliant on just financial aid for, for the MBA. And so luckily for those folks outside of Japan in general, there are quite a few scholarship opportunities and so I did pursue the next scholarship quite um, aggressively. I wasn't successful at first. I wrote a bunch of essays and submitted applications. I got rejected a couple of times. But luckily, once I was started to apply to Hitotsubashi, I was fortunate enough to get support jointly with the university to obtain the next scholarship for my year with Hitotsubashi during my MBA. So I was supremely grateful and um, honored to receive that and that helped out quite a bit because obviously it, it helps with your tuition and a little bit with your daily expenses so that took a load off my shoulders and I was able to um, enjoy a little bit more of my time in Japan by doing some you know uh, summer break trip here or spring break trip there so um, see a little bit more of the countryside stuff like that. How was the educational experience? Um, you said you could have done two but one you'd be mm. a bit more busy because you're, you're putting a lot of you know material into one year. I've had a pretty interesting educational experience. Uh, chemical engineering is a very intense program. I'm obviously I'm, I'm biased there are a lot of intense programs out <laughs> there but Are-y. I did yeah <laughs> hearing hats off. Yeah the reason for the, me bringing that up is not to, to toot my own horn. The reason I bring that up is I've had a, a pretty, I have a pretty good fee, uh, understanding of, you know, Hey, what are kind of, what does an all nighter feel like? What are some of these intense semesters and programs feel like? And the, you know, the Hitotsubashi one year program was as intense as it gets, especially during the first half to first three quarters of the one year program. It is, I think, a very high quality program. It, it, it from last I remember, it's on a, a, a forced ranking system. So there's only a certain number of A's, certain number of B's and C's that go around. Um, the teachers are uh, top class. They are fully, fully committed. The uh, quality of the discussions, the, the cases you study, everything I, I found was fantastic. And so the intensity, the, um, the emphasis on basic things, which sounds silly, but it really matters. Attendance, uh, quality of the, the, the homework assignments you submit, the participation in classes, it really does start to come together and you see um, everything working well, harmoniously, one entire MBA package. So I found it was a great program, very, very competitive, very intense. And once it started to ease off a bit, once you got enough credits and you were in that last stretch, 
you were able to kind of take a step back and say, okay, I'll take a couple of classes and then I'm going to really, again, not enjoy Tokyo, but like experience Tokyo. You're in the middle of this wonderful city and, you know, you might be able to be able to have a cup of coffee with, a, a, you know, an alumni who is already working for a Japanese company to see how that's going or reach out to uh, um, the professor's friend who's working for another company to see how that experience is. So in, it, it, it's a nice little um, transition where you're intensely working on your studies and then you got this wonderful city at your fingertips um i'm a big fan of tokyo you just got absolutely class so companies a lot of talent and it's just a great city with so much culture and so much to see and do as it's a yeah. wonderful, um, extended campus uh, to the mba program there's not too many places i think that you can really say the location and where Hitotsubashi ICS is located in the right across from the Imperial, Imperial Palace, it's truly just uh, you you really for, you forget about how close it is to this wonderful cultural center. It's it's truly amazing. So Lou, when you were finishing up that year and you know starting to take the foot off the gas a little bit, um, it's a new you know you start to and I remember this feeling when I was. Uh, approaching graduation which is what comes after yeah uh, finding that job or staying with the prior employer do you work in japan do you work you know overseas uh, can you tell us about the process for you and, and what you decided to do and so i did pursue quite a bit of job opportunities while in japan and i you know i did what every mba student does you know if there's a job opening that looks interesting and something that I think I would be good at. You know, I'm applying to it. I'm trying to go to all the the career uh, building sessions, you know, get my resume out there. The reality that many people find is, you know, Japanese language is a, is a big part. Um, unless you really have strong, and I mean very strong connections with individuals who will vouch for you, that's the word. Um, it's hard to get a job in a company in Japan that balances, at least for me, the things that I'm looking for, you know, career, a uh, uh, decent salary, um, an environment that I, am I interested in and I want to grow in, of people I'm going to be happy with and, and work well with. So, you know, for me, I my Japanese level is like a JLPT N3, which is still not good enough, you know, for uh, Japanese business, you know, even N2 it can be kind of borderline and then N1 obviously is the best. So that one's ideal. So since I was an oil and gas individual without really much experience under my belt outside of that, you still get kind of uh, that becomes your little box. And so it was easier for me to find I, I, was, I was fortunate enough and I was grateful to get a job offer from an oil company in Japan. I think it was their own one of their few um, oil producers uh, in Japan, right. and so uh, unfortunately, though the salary was not as competitive as my salary back in the U.S., which is fairly typical. But like I said, you know, the balance of what I'm looking for, you know, the the oil industry was one where I was trying not trying to get out of, but I was looking for a change. I mean, the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main reasons I was doing the MBA was get a little bit more um, well-rounded, perhaps um, find something that I'm more suited for, whether it be project management or more IT, I, you know, IS type type work, because I have my sights set on Japan. And although Japan needs energy, they're not a huge oil and gas type country. So I, the, the writing was on the wall, so to speak, with if I was going to stay in oil and gas, my opportunities in Japan would be relatively uh, limited. And so I decided because that was my only job offer and it wasn't really, you know, uh, the salary range I was looking for, decided to go back to the U.S. and see what I can do there and pursue a job that would kind of keep get me, let me go uh, kind of get by. And then I would continue to look for opportunities that would connect me back to Japan. Right. So I rejoined, um, I did some consulting work for a while. And um, eventually I was faced with a difficult decision because I still wasn't having a very uh, good time finding a new uh, job but, uh, with J Japan Connections. And then luckily after a lot of struggle and a lot of 
um, hard work, I was able to find the opportunity where I'm working now today with uh, a, a relatively large tech company uh, in Japan. And I work more on the cybersecurity side now. And so it's been a long journey, but it wasn't easy. I would say if I was perhaps five to seven years younger, I probably would have just taken the job, got my foot in the door while I was in Japan and hop ship somewhere else. But it was more challenging for me. I was married, we were trying to start a family and um, I really needed to kind of have a little bit of stability. So um, that was sort of my, my journey there. Well, th there's a lot to unpack there because it's, it's really quite fascinating. And, you know, we, we want to, you know, uh, maintain some privacy, but, you know, sure. the jump from energy to one of Japan's largest tech companies, a lot of people are wondering how, how did you do that? Um, you, you mentioned the search for um, companies or jobs connected to Japan. I'm, you know, how did you do that search? A lot of it, I think, comes down to how much, you know, you're willing to put in and, and pursue this. I can be, like many folks, be very intense and focused um, if there's something that you care passionately about. And so when I realized that I wanted to be connected to Japan and work for a Japanese company or, or a company that has strong ties to Japan, it really became like a mission for me. And so after I got my feet back under me in the US and I was working, you know, it was a job, but it wasn't my long-term career, I started to really just focus on what can I do, what's my plan to get connected to a job or something in Japan. And so I focused on my resume. I, 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 I touched up LinkedIn. I researched career forums. I talked to my Japanese colleagues. I, I used every ounce of energy and all the different uh, feelers that I could put out there to, to be as efficient as possible to, to, uh, to try and get any opportunity for a job or a new, new chance to get back, back out to Japan. And so, you know, I think there's the Boston Career Forum. I went to that and I um, talked to, you know, I think it was uh, Tokyo Gas. I, I talked to Amazon Japan, which, which got me a, an interview. Uh, it wasn't successful, unfortunately, but um, I was able to get connected out there. But again, language limits you. Uh, so again, I wasn't N2 and there were quite a bit of very talented language speaking individuals. Um, I looked for opportunities over here with uh, my coworkers. I got introduced to a couple of, um, what would you call it? Like smaller consulting firms who have operations in Japan. So I, I did a couple of interviews there that went well, but again, consulting, I, I, personally, I didn't want to do consulting long-term. So I just kept on trying. I must have applied to hundreds of LinkedIn and other job uh, positions. You no, know, I just researched what are the largest um, Sogo Shosha um, trading companies in, in Japan and wh where are their operations? Let me just apply. So I tried to create resumes and applications that got my name out there as much as possible. Finally found an opportunity for the company that I'm at now in cybersecurity. And I, I have no cyber, I had no cybersecurity experience at the time, but I felt very strongly that there's not many individuals with an MBA from Tokyo, Japan, with experience, international experience right. in and around Japan. And so I pursued that very uh, aggressively. I had a very good interview. I actually didn't get the job the first round, but I didn't give up. And that's another message I'd like to say to folks. If you really care deeply about something, don't give up. You know, you still can be polite. You don't have to be rude and aggressive about it, but I maintained a strong connection with the hiring manager. And I reached out from time to time. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, please let me know if there's any opportunities. I felt I really had a good conversation. And you know, I was trying to get my foot in the door because on paper, it looks like I am a risk. I don't have cybersecurity experience, but man, here's somebody with Japanese cultural experience, business experience, and an MBA in Japan. And so eventually I got another job interview with the same company and I was able to get successfully hired. And ever since then, it's been an amazing, wonderful experience. And I've just been operating at a very high level and I've enjoyed it ever since. And so I've gotten about four years of cybersecurity project management experience under my belt. And that's how it kind of all went.
wow, now, you know, you, you, that's now part of you. That's now part of your resume and your skill set. Going back to the MBA, that time spent in Japan, do you feel that that differentiated you? You said you felt, you know, there can't be many individuals with these type of overlapping skill sets. But when you actually got into the Japanese company, um, how did that MBA uh, help? Well, right off the bat, it was a talking point. I remember distinctly in, if not every one of the individual interviews I had, definitely at the hiring manager level and the recruiter level, they were very, very impressed slash surprised. Wow, you did an MBA in Tokyo. How was that? You must be really interested in Japanese business and Japanese culture. And so at a minimum, it was a very, it was an eye catcher, a very interesting point on the resume that immediately folks took notice of. Beyond that, you ask any Japanese professional uh, individual who's familiar with universities in Japan, and Hitotsubashi is very well recognized. Um, people hear it and they go, wow, that's, that's, um, that's, that's great. How did, um, uh, good for you. I, and that's a very prestigious university. And so um, it is recognized. And so I do strongly attribute a lot of my success in getting my foot in the door was I backed up my verbal excitement and my verbal passion with on paper, you know, hey, I've done the MBA in Japan. Hey, I've worked in Japan. I have experience. So I can, you know, it kind of the messaging and the story all comes together. It's not just me saying I like Japan. I like working in Japan. I backed it up. And so that together, really worked well and um you know i could talk about it at length you know the fact that it really does train you well to work optimally in in a company like that i i felt yeah all around it was integral to my success for getting the job and then being successful in it how did you find working for a japanese company outside of japan compared to your experience having you know worked for multiple u.s companies uh, this is interesting because you know, I worked for an American oil company, a very large American oil company, uh, you know, Exxon Mobil. Um, they're headquartered in Dallas, Texas. And I mean, the classic American business where it's very hierarchical, very top down, you know, and it's a very serious business. And they're, they're the parent company of operations, you know, in Singapore, Japan, Thailand, et cetera. And so, when I worked in that environment, you still had this very strong Japanese culture and, and Japanese business that was not at odds. I don't want to paint that picture, but there was there were forces at play. Right. And so at the end, though, it was still an American company. So the the Japanese forces could always be somewhat managed because whatever came over the fence from the headquarters it tended to be the final say. Right. But. So you, you, it still was a nice introduction to Japanese business culture because I, I remember distinctly so many stories of uh, the, you know, Japanese refineries kind of saying yes and, and nodding and, and agreeing to doing something, but then completely um, configuring the tool in a way where it, it rendered the tool useless. Anyway, that's another story. So now working for a Japanese company and you have a US based office, it's a completely different dynamic. You definitely feel that, okay, yes, the Tokyo headquarters, they're the one who really determine the direction, the, the tone, um, everything that uh, is going on. And so you, you, you get a, not that relationships aren't important in American companies, obviously they are, but you know, the, the, the breadth of the company now and how close you are with individuals really, you know, that trust factor, the relationships, your communication skills play a really big, big part. Um, I realize that process is uh, even more important. Uh, how the things are done are as important or more important versus what actually is being done. So it's better to, to take it a little bit slowly, to over communicate to make sure that you've gotten all the right stakeholders involved. So a lot of the folks on the American side, 
they would slip up and trip a few times trying to get things done, even though they were extremely well qualified and technically oriented, but it was the way how they did their, their uh, activities or their projects that sometimes rub individuals the wrong way or they didn't handle the relationship properly. And so I found that those elements were, were extremely important and my MBA, my business background in Japan um, helped me out wonderfully with some of those challenging experiences because you just there's this expression called uh, kuki o yomu, a kind of like reading the air and sensing the atmosphere. And it's so true when you're in a Japanese company in the US or in Japan, there's yeah. so much that's uh, being said without being said, and you have to have your antenna up. And in the US, if you're not exposed to that, it's not really something that you have experience, a lot of experience with. Right. I mean, so I found that that was what really jumped out at me, just the, um, the relationships, the calm skills, the focus on process and how you do the thing versus, you know, what's being done, that importance and, and whatnot. But yeah. Those, those soft skills are so important. Um, yeah. It's really critical. Well, Lou, there's a lot of people that I think similar to you, um, mm -hmm. passionate about, J about Japan, would love to find a way to work in Japan or, or in some way connected to Japan. If you had advice to give to a, a younger adult, maybe, you know, in their 20s, uh, that is passionate about Japan, but it's it's having difficulty um, kind of charting the path, right? Because it's not like becoming a doctor where yeah. I, I go to medical school and there's this established path. It's it's much more of kind of a, you know, it's it's a real adventure, a journey. You know, what, what, what advice would you have for them? Uh, everyone talks about it. It is language. You know, obviously, if you have the time and the skills, even if you don't have the skills, sometimes it's just a matter of how much time you put into it, but brush up on that Japanese. It, it is something that regardless of your path, nine and a half times out of 10, you're gonna need it slash use it slash it's gonna um, make a difference in whatever career you pursue. So if you haven't brushed up on the language or achieved you know, at least N2 uh, type proficiency and you have the time, uh, do it. Um, do the intense courses, do the remembering the kanji uh, programs, uh, brush it, uh, it'll find out a system that works for you and really commit to it. Because I'll tell you from firsthand experience, you know, I have a family, I have a very, very demanding job. It's almost impossible to really devote the consistent time that Japanese studies require for you to maintain your current level and then build on top of that. So it just gets more challenging over time. So if you're younger and you have the time, investing in languages is great. Um, beyond that, I would say, figure out what you really want out of your career slash why Japan. You know, if you wanna live in Japan and just have an experience, you probably can do that pretty quickly. Not that it's gonna be easy, but there are a lot of wonderful programs like, uh, a jet program, as you've talked about many times, Ian, and some other programs where you can probably just um, pick up an application, do some uh, diligence study, um, properly follow through, and you might be on your way to uh, to Japan. And if that's the experience you want, um, you, you, hey, you've got it. Um, but if you want to live in Japan, um, have a career, have a sustainable job with um, a decent salary, that might take some more thinking because there are trade-offs you know i went the career route first and i'm still going the career route where i let my career expose me to japan or i really try to put the time in to get in my career right and always put myself on a track to japan so right. i don't have very very high language skills but i'm very happy in my job i do consider it a career I do consider it to have more steps remaining on the career ladder. And I might have an opportunity, hopefully, fingers crossed, to, to live in Japan on assignment. Now, my language skills are still N3, but all those things are possible because I've decided to put a lot of time into sharpening my career skills and putting the long hours on the career side. So 
Um, it really depends on what you want to get out of your your Japan experience, your your life in Japan. For me, I want to have a career, and I would love to be there somewhat longer term.、Um, you know, and then then it comes down to what do you want to do? For me, I knew oil and gas was not going to work out long term, as I mentioned earlier.、Right. It's it's not that there aren't jobs in Japan in oil and gas. It's just you know. Take a Japanese refinery. Everyone there speaks Japanese. You don't need many English-speaking slash bi- bilingual individuals. They're they're operator type jobs. They're、um, a little bit more specialized jobs. So it was either me getting N one and getting very very lucky, or saying, all right, what are other areas that I can go into? You know, things like nursing,、uh, geriatric, dentistry.、Um, IT,、um, information security, cybersecurity, and that was where I decided that, oh, if I pursue a career in cybersecurity and information security, if it doesn't work out in my current job, which I do hope it it stays my career for my my、uh, entirety of my、uh, the rest of my uh, professional uh, uh, life, so to speak.、Um, If it doesn't work out, I can jump to other opportunities. Everyone needs cybersecurity in Japan. It's it's becoming more and more of a hot topic, a, de- a skill set in demand. So I would say think about what skills and career、uh, options you want to pursue that will set you up for success if the first option doesn't work out, and try to make that advantageous to you in the long run. So I wanted to get that right, and so I'm very happy that I was able to make this jump to infosec. And cybersecurity because I feel like now I've got a relatively strong focus on Japan and the tech side,、right. and so if it does warrant me to make a change, I can hopefully find another opportunity relatively quickly. Wow, yeah, such a such a growth field,、um, and then combining that with the Japanese skill sets, really quite quite a rare.、Um, yeah, yeah. And, and if you don't mind me mentioning too,、um, make your plan. Um, I am naturally a planner. I know everyone、um, has different personalities, different skill sets, but it really does help. Two-year, five-year, heck, ten-year plan.、Um, write it on paper. Put it in a mind map on the computer. Do whatever works for you, but figure out where you want to be because you know you're 20 years old or 18 or 22, whatever. How old you are, those years. You'd be surprised. It's not that they go fast, but you know, when you say you want to be in Japan in、uh, X amount of time, there's you, you have to make those little building blocks kind of all line up so you can get to that、uh, step there. You can't just make this leap in many cases. So having that plan in place is really helpful. And then being up, being upfront and clear with yourself on what types of risks you want to take. It was a risk for me to leave my corporate job and pursue this. Career path in Japan on the oil and gas side, but I felt it was warranted because I wouldn't be happy with my professional and personal life if I didn't do this. I I was very very set on this is what I want to do and this is where I'm fulfilled and and happy professionally. And if you find that in yourself, don't don't compromise. Take those risks within reason, and you know pursue it with that energy and passion. And I think that'll really help. Uh, propel you forward.、Uh, that, that planning really、uh, strikes a chord with me. I think if just the power of getting something from your mind onto paper,、yeah. really helps you actualize it. And、um, writing it down and visualizing it, and then over time you start finding yourself walking in that direction. Well,、yeah. Lou, thank you. I learned a lot today.、Um, your、thank、story you. is is very inspiring, and I'm sure that the the community very much will benefit. I know、uh, during your time while getting an MBA that you documented part of that、uh, on YouTube. So if if you're okay, we'll share that in the show notes. And again, thank you for your time today. Sure. And if anybody wants to ever reach out,、um, feel free. You know, I'm happy to answer any questions.、Um, definitely believe a lot in the you know pay it forward mentality, and however we can help each other make these things、uh, reality, that would be great. Well, thank you, Lou, and、sure. everyone. You heard that, so please be sure if you have any questions to put them down in the、uh, comments section. Thank you, Lou, for your time. Thank you very much, Ian.